we spot a rare beast, the last of the true jaguars. Hey, and welcome back to Low Tech Garage. I'm Josh, and today we're gonna to be talking about why this is the last of the true jaguars. Now, this may sound dumb to some of you, but this has actually been a pretty hotly debated topic, or at least for people who really like jaguars. And what better time to talk about it than one where it's starting to rain. Now, before we kick things off, this is a great time to remind you, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. If you are a Jaguar fan, we have a ton of great content. And of course, we have a lot more coming as well. So we really appreciate it if you hit that subscribe button, check out some of the other cool videos we got coming your way. And of course, if you don't like them, you can always choose to unsubscribe later. But that being said, I think it's time to get into the reasoning why this is the last true Jaguar. Now to start with, we're probably going to need to define what would be a true Jaguar, right? Where are the roots of the company and what makes us, you know, able to say this is what a true Jaguar is. And to do that, we have to go all the way back to 1935. That is when the first Jaguar car was actually released. Very quickly after their inception, they gained a reputation for building very capable sports cars. That was their very first foundation, was actually more in the performance oriented market and their peak came at the XK120. That was an absolute world beater of a car and truly, truly an icon that changed the game in a lot of ways. But like most sports car manufacturers at one point or another realized, those don't necessarily bring in the volume that will keep the lights on. So they had to figure out a market that they could expand into and succeed at that would sell a higher volume of vehicles and really keep you know the bills paid and let them stay focused on also building these sports cars, which is kind of what they truly wanted to do. And enter the luxury saloon. After really cementing their name in the 50s with two Le Mans wins, which is a huge deal, they really had a good reputation and were able to leverage that by selling basically high-end luxury vehicles. Uh, and again, think 50s, right? I know this is a modern one, but again, these are in the 50s, still well-appointed with wood, leather, nice features, reliable, strong engines. Uh, and they were very desirable to well-off, you know, upper-class people. And that is where Jaguar really found traction. So they figured out that they kind of had this perfect balance between sports cars and also luxury cars. Now, over the course of many years of successfully building both sports cars and luxury cars, obviously they combined the two at some point and were able to make very sporting but very lovely luxury cars. This is where the name, or phrase I should say, grace, space, and pace came about. It could almost be seen as Jaguar's promise to the buyer that they were going to get all three of those things in one package, and I believe that they hit that mark excellently for many, many, many decades. I mean, just look at an XK120, or a Mark II, or honestly, a 420G for that matter. Look at all of those, and every single one is a work of art in the body lines, lovely appointing of leather and wood and all of the things you would expect from a Jaguar on the inside, powerful, smooth, quiet motors, I mean, just fantastic vehicles all around. And again, that is what they were known for. So to me, those are the facets of what makes a true Jag a true Jag. Excellent craftsmanship. Didn't have to be necessarily overdone or overly complicated. Just all the creature comforts that you could want for the time, along with good performance, but yet not sacrificing comfort for that performance. So why then do we say that the X308 is the last true Jag rather than, let's say, the X300 that came before it or the X350 that came just after? I mean, the X350 still had the traditional sedan-shaped body lines. It's still a very attractive car. And the X300 had almost the exact same exterior body as the X308, and if anything, came with the straight six and the V12 that they were so famous for. Um, so there's good arguments for both. However, I found a lot of people, and I myself included, agree that the V8 X308 is the last perfectly executed traditional Jaguar. And getting this out of the way right now, after the X350, when they moved to the entire new styling that you see running around today, I believe that those are in an entire different market segment. Um, you know, they've, they've caught up with the world and it was definitely a necessary step that they had to take. However, it did get away finally from, I think, the true roots of Jaguar. And it's okay. I mean, brands are allowed to change, but, you know, they've moved away from the true traditional Jaguar model and into what would sell, which is important. Otherwise, the brand would cease to exist. Um, so I'm kind of taking those off the table right now. I personally don't believe that any of the new models could be considered the last true Jaguar because frankly, 
I mean, you look at them and they have a very space-aged appearance. They're very slick and swoopy. You know, they're not really the clean, classy, classic look. And on top of that, they lost a lot of the comfort. They lost a lot of the softness that you would expect from a proper luxury vehicle. And again, they provide a lot of luxury. In fact, they provide more features, obviously, than this car does. I'm not saying that by any means they're not a luxury vehicle, but they have fallen prey to what every other brand has fallen to, which is basically the idea that it's got to go around the Nürburgring super fast. It's got to look, you know, like all these other super futuristic, modern looking things. It's got to have every single bell and whistle with big screens and all that. So they kind of lost their identity a little, if you ask me. So getting back to our key three contenders for the last true Jag. Now the X350 that came after the X308 that I'm currently sitting in could be argued as the last true Jag. However, here are my points as to why I think it may actually have been the first of the newer Jags. The entire body was switched to an all aluminum construction. This was done to save weight, to allow for more technology to be put into the car and things like that, while also making it physically larger. I've had one parked right next to mine before. They're notably taller and they're also kind of actually significantly bigger. This led to a little more interior room, which is a very lovely thing to have, as well as extra features and things like that. But I actually believe that detracts from the true Jag roots. The engines all had variable valve timing, which was a lovely feature, extremely responsive. I mean, I've driven one and they are fantastic. The six speed automatic gearbox, very responsive. And it's like voodoo magic. It knows what gear to be in, when to be in it. It feels very, very, very competent, but it feels a little too futuristic. I want my Jaguar to feel like a bit of a muscle car almost, but under, you know, layer on layer on layer of sound deadening and leather and padding and softening. The newer Jag, simple things like when you close the door, when you, you know, when you feel it go over a bump, you know, things like that, it doesn't feel like a solidly built car. The X308 is the last of the steel bodied Jags running on traditional suspension, or at least the vast majority of them are. Um, and it still has that feel where its job is to just insulate you from the world and keep you comfortable. Another feature is the cast suspension. Now, the very last of the X308s, you could actually get that as a, an option on these. Not many were made that way. However, on the X350, that was pretty much standard fare. They all had this advanced air suspension system. And it made the cars handle extremely well um, and also led to some problems as you know, far as failures and things like that. But again, I feel like they were starting to get a little too technical for their own good and starting to get away from what made a Jag a Jag. They were working on keeping up with the market, what the expectations were out in the, the world proper, rather than staying to the roots. Again, understandable. You got to do that to stay relevant as a brand. But I think that was the first model that began to stray away from traditional Jaguar. But if I'm being such a stickler about traditional Jaguar, how can my V8 Jaguar, which is obviously not a Jag thing, you know, be the last true Jag, right? I mean, if we want to be, you know, sticklers about it, then why wasn't the X300 the last true one with its V12 and straight six options? And that is a really, really good question. Now, you could get into a lot of technicality on how you're judging it. And if to you it is literally the straight six or V12 is a make or break because that's what Jag always did then actually you would have a very good argument for the X300 being the last true Jag. But I feel like the V8 that they implemented was executed absolutely perfectly. And I'm being very particular here. If this V8 was not so well made and so beautifully silky smooth and all of the things that it does so well, instantly I would discount it and agree that the X300 is probably the last true Jag. Now, as far as V8s go, this one is relatively advanced dual overhead cam, all aluminum, forged internals. Uh, I mean, it's it's a very well-made engine, especially for the time, and it makes a significant amount of power for its displacement as well. But interesting little things. Jag, for instance, kept the displacement of the V8 in line with the traditional displacements that were so common in the earlier Jags. So for instance, you'll have a 4 liter and a 4.2 liter, which earlier six cylinders would be a 4 liter and a 4.2 liter. They also made sure that it was extremely quiet and extremely smooth running. So it had basically all of the same effect that driving the notoriously smooth straight sixes would have. But what they did achieve by moving over to the V8 was getting back into relevance when it came to the actual performance side of things. The straight sixes 
quite frankly, were a little underpowered for the weight of the car. So as much as they built a nice luxury saloon, they were losing a little bit of that performance orientation. You could get the straight six XJR and they were quite quick, but they still didn't quite have enough power to be really, really, really sporty. And again, not knocking the XJR six, absolutely love that and would love to own one. But I feel like the last little bump in power that came with the V8 was what it needed to be a true sports saloon. But what about the V12, you may ask? Well, the V12, the problem is, as much as it made, I think, right about 300 horsepower at that time, it's a very heavy engine. Now, looks fantastic, sounds fantastic, and it doesn't get more jag than a V12. However, same deal, didn't really provide the performance aspect. I mean, mostly, they were kind of somewhat marketing the last of the, the traditional V12 jag thing in that generation. They were trying to do its kind of last hurrah, before they let it go. And having lived with this car for a while, I can tell you that it truly, truly drives like a piece of history. I mean, closing the doors feels like a bank fall still, which is exactly what you would expect just by looking at it. But yet, it doesn't have this big barge-like appearance. It's low, it's slick, it has a very sporty appearance. For a saloon car, it's quite impressive. But yet, you look underneath, it has great ground clearance as well. They've managed to absolutely nail the proportions and lines of this vehicle. And also, your X350 doesn't do that. You still have the beautiful, almost overdone badging because you really need to make sure that people know what you're driving. Absolutely lovely leather seats, a real walnut steering wheel, analog clock, and again, more leather than you know what to do with. And this car has the perfect amount of modern features. For instance, the memory settings in this are fantastic. When you get in, the seats adjust back into position, as does the telescoping and tilt steering wheel. The mirrors, everything dial themselves in for you. You've got, uh, you know, all of the little bells and whistles that you would want, like automatic wipers, automatic headlights, good sound system. For the time, a car phone, which actually kind of made a little bit of sense. A lovely sound system without being overdone. Still restrained, but if, you know, lovely audio system without needing to mess with anything. And of course, the little details that let you know, for instance, that you bought the XJR are still subtle and restrained. It's still a luxury, tasteful vehicle. Ever so subtly stamped into the steering wheel. And you just have that small note there that says supercharged. It's not this big glaring thing with a giant R in bright red that's flashing and telling you, look, you got the fast one. So to me, at least, that's why this car is the last true Jag. And I can already hear some of you screaming in the comments below, and I'm looking forward to it because I want to hear your arguments as well. Don't take this as me just telling you that this is the only right answer and you better accept it because quite frankly, everyone may have a different opinion on this. So drop me a comment if you think the same as me or if you think different than me. And if you think different than me, what is your last true Jag and why? And I'm going to wrap the video here. So please consider hitting that subscribe button. It would really mean the world to us. I would suggest doing it right now. Watch some of our videos as they come out. And if you change your mind and don't like it, you can always hit that unsubscribe button later. It is super easy, but I bet you're going to like the content you see. If you enjoyed this video right now, click that like button. Don't move on and forget. It really does help us. It helps the world see that this was good, engaging content, and it means the world to us when you do hit that like button. And of course, if you really, really, really love us, if you've heard me ask it before, go check out our Patreon. See if it's something where you might want to support a YouTube creator. We don't make a ton of money doing this, but every little bit helps. We do it because we love it, and every dollar helps us do more and more engaging things. So uh, you do get unique content over there that's Patreon-specific. There are good reasons. We try and make it worth your while. So if you've heard me say it before and you've thought about it before, click on it, check it out. We would really appreciate it. But that wraps it up for now. So we'll catch you on the next one.